Did X-Men 97 peak in its first two episodes? Let's talk about that. The following is a world-class bullshitters exclusive. So folks, last week we talked about X-Men 97 in its first two episodes, and well, I was very positive about this show. I'll reiterate what I said last week. I'm a long time X-Men fan. I'm in my 30s at this point. I grew up watching the old cartoon. I've loved the movies, the video games. I have the toys behind me on the shelf. I am an X-Men fan. So I was excited for X-Men 97, but I was also aware of the climate we live in because I've been doing this for quite some time. And well, there's a phrase that says we can't have nice things. And normally when Disney's behind that, that statement is true. But for the first two episodes of X-Men 97, I was pleasantly surprised and found myself enjoying X-Men for the first time in a long time. Well, I'm happy to say that this week continues the trend with the third episode. So this week's episode is titled Fire Made Flesh, and this one is really interesting because it gives us something we haven't had in X-Men in a long time. So like I said at the beginning of this, I'm a big X-Men fan. I go back, I read the comics regularly, I really enjoy it. What this week gave us was something we haven't seen in quite some time, a really exciting psychic battle. Now folks, if you're a longtime X-Men fan, you know that a lot of X-Men have a lot of psychic powers. There's Professor X, there's Jean Grey, there's Emma Frost, there's other people out there that have these powers. And so it's really interesting to see these manifestations created in a visual medium. And this week we get a lot of that, but I'm jumping the gun a little bit. So this episode picks up where last week's ended off, where we have Jean Grey appear at the X-Mansion. Well, it looks like Jean Grey, but Jean Grey just gave birth, and Jean Grey's there on the team, and wait a second, I guess it's not Jean Grey. So like a lot of things here on the show, if you read the books, you're going to know what's going on. And last week, we all knew this was Madeline Pryor. So for those who don't know, the comic book version of this story involves uh, Jean Grey dying as the Phoenix, Cyclops meets another woman named Madeline Pryor, they go off, they do their thing, they have a baby, he abandons them, Madeline finds out she's a clone created by Mr. Sinister to create Cable, like, it's a lot of shit. And this show surprisingly does a really good job at tying all of those elements into a 33 minute episode and telling a really interesting story both... Uh, you know, visually as well as thematically. Like, I really want to praise the visuals in this episode of X-Men 97. This thing is awesome. So once we find out that Madeline and Jean are two separate entities, Beast, you know, the scientist of the team, well, he does some research. He carbon dates the women, and he realizes that the passed out Jean, it would be the right age, and Madeline Pryor just isn't the right age. So we kind of have her freak out, and all this stuff happens, and... I don't want to spoil every little detail on the show because this is one you're definitely going to watch because the visuals are such a surprise and if you don't, you really don't want to know what's coming. It's like a haunted house, literally, this time. And do you want somebody to tell you where each jump scare is? Do you want everyone to say, around this corner, here comes the boogeyman. Around that corner is Freddy Krueger. Look under the stairs, it's a zombie. Like, no, you want to go in and you want to have a good time. So this X-Men episode has a lot of really cool horror visuals. And it's something that I love because I love horror 24-7. I'm not one of the October people that goes, oh, horror, I'm here to celebrate. Let me get pumpkin spice and all that other bullshit. No, I'm like, yo, it's March. Let's watch A Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I'm always down for a good horror movie. Bad ones, too. They're usually more fun. But I digress. My point is, though, this X-Men episode gives us a lot of psychological horror. A lot of inner fears manifested into reality. And that's what I really loved about this episode. It was another visual feast. At points, this show looked like a really good horror anime. It just flowed well, it was blended well. A lot of the complaints I had about the overabundant CGI-looking animation while not perfect, it's a lot better in this episode. Maybe it has to do with the darker colors, the shadowing, the shading. I don't know exactly what it is. I may be an artist, but I'm not an animator, so I couldn't tell you those details. But what I can tell you is that I really liked what I saw. And again, it makes X-Men 97 something to look forward to. I'm actually looking forward to next week's episode already. I know we're only a few minutes into the review, but I'm telling you this already. I'm looking forward to what's next because the rest of this episode was fairly exciting, uh, like, every minute. There really wasn't anything that was slow or boring. We learn about Mr. Sinister and his intentions to have cloned Jean Grey and to have 
created basically a baby that they can steal, Nathan Summers, a.k.a. Cable, and we see all of this. We see Mr. Sinister steal Madeline's baby. We see Cyclops and Wolverine and Morph and a few others go off to save said baby, and when they do, they didn't realize that the baby who was being held in this green goo was, uh, you know being exposed to this virus that Mr. Sinister was trying to make him invincible, immortal if you will. And by removing the baby, the baby's been exposed to the techno-organic virus. And that was pretty cool to see because if you're a longtime X-Men fan, you know those little green rectangles that would pop up on people? You knew they were sick. So it was cool to see that. It was cool to see that Bishop's gonna take, well Bishop took Cable to the future. And we see Madeline Pryor escape and we have to watch Jean and Cyclops rekindle their relationship. It was a lot of cool team dynamics it's one of those situations where again if you think this show is a bunch of beat you over the head stuff you might be missing out on some good quality x-men writing again i haven't enjoyed the x-men this much since the 90s and this really does do a good job at adapting the chris claremont john byrne era well paul smith in this case but the chris claremont era across the board because he is the definitive voice of x-men it's not stanley it's no one else it's not anybody. Claremont is the man. He's the king of the X-Men. You know, I was going to make a comparison about another creative on another book, but there really isn't such a definitive creative voice in terms of writing. You can argue Romita's artistic voice on Spider-Man is second to none, or Neil Adams' work on Batman is second to none, but realistically, Chris Claremont and the X-Men go hand in hand. The best work comes from that man, and a lot of that is being adapted here for X-Men 97. So again, I find that very refreshing. Now, if you want to look a little deeper into this episode, now, first off as well, you have to take this into account, this is a very insular episode that takes place essentially at like a castle in the X-Mansion, and part of it's in the psyche of characters, so it's really a small story. It's not humanity versus mutants. There's not the allegory here and there. Also, too, for those wondering um, about Sunspot, he is still interested in Jubilee, so don't worry about that. But I will say, if you're looking for any of the coded things or whatever people are looking for, Morph is a little on the nose. I mean, he's very overt, but, you know, it's kind of played for laughs because every time he transforms, he transforms into a woman. But he also transforms into men. Like, it's just all kind of played to be a laugh. So I don't find it a problem. I'm sure some people will look at that and roll their eyes. That's about as far as it goes, if that's a thing that you even care about. I only talk about it because I know a portion of our audience does, but me personally, that doesn't get factored into my score. It was a little weird when, you know, Morph is trying to talk to uh, Wolverine in the shower, but it's like part of a nightmare thing. So I'm sure you can psychoanalyze Morph's sexuality if you want to, or you can not, and you can watch the other things in the show. It's all up to you, but it's not one of those glaring things that you have to avoid to enjoy this episode. I only put it out there so I can remain honest with you guys each and every week. But overall, I was impressed with this one once again. It captures the X-Men in a way that I enjoy that I'm not seeing anywhere else. Not in the comic books, not in the movies for many years, only here. I would like to see a resurgence in this era of X-Men, mainly because I want to see these characters be the definitive X-Men team. I understand there's a lot of different ones out there, people have favorites, I'm not saying that your favorites are invalid. But when I go pick up an X-Men comic, and this has now just been changed, so excuse me for sounding a little late to the party, but it's nice to know when I pick up an X-Men book, I'm getting a specific team. And now, after all of these years, they're trying to reset the X-Men and make it uh, palatable, because this is the shift to make X-Men Marvel's big property. You know, the Avengers have come and gone. Now it's the X-Men's time. But overall, I'm very impressed with what I'm getting. I, you know, want... To just keep watching. That pause was because I was trying to think what I want. I'm entertained when I watch this show. Is it different? Yes. Is it different from my childhood? Of course. Nostalgia is only so powerful. And thankfully this show, unlike something like Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, doesn't rely strictly on nostalgia. It understands that nostalgia is the vehicle to take you back. But now it's time to tell you a story on top of that. So again, this is another positive episode. Again, I would recommend it. If you haven't been watching this series, but you're watching our videos, well, thank you. That's cool. That's that's awesome. You don't have to watch it. Just watch me talk about it each and every week. If you have specific questions, you can shoot us emails to worldclassbs at mail.com, and we can talk about X-Men as well. Now, of course, I'm going to be back next week with the X-Men review, so be on the lookout for that. But it's nice to say that I'm really looking forward to it. I want to see what's next. I want to see what's going on between Gambit, Rogue, and Magneto, even though I've read the book, so I know what's going on. But I want to see how they do it. 
I will have to say, in terms of criticisms, there are a few. Like, I thought the whole Madeline Pryor separation, Jean Grey reintegration was a very quick thing to have happen. I mean, I get it. There, you can only go so far with this baby before there's this weird point of no return. But I do feel like they're just like, oh, goodbye, gone. And I guess that works great. I guess, you know, you could look at it as a criticism or you could look at it as a positive. I just thought it was, wow, that was fast. But are we really supposed to linger on these things? I mean... They don't linger on anything in these. They're cartoons. They're 33 minute episodes. So I'm glad they don't really linger on anything boring. They did bring a few things that I wanted to talk about uh, positives as well. For example, when Jean Grey or Madeline Pryor looks at her wedding photo, it's the cover of the X Men comic book from when Scott and Jean actually got married back in the 90s. So that was cool. I thought that was a nice little touch. I mean, this show really understands the visuals of X Men, it really understands the visuals of all of this. It shows you. You know, the classic designs, but with a slightly modern style in terms of the animation. The figure anatomy is a little more um, consistent. It's a nice looking show in terms of that. I wish the animation was a little less choppy. I wish it looked a little less like Flash animation, but I do like the character designs. I'm getting used to the voices. They're not great. You know, Gambit is still offensively bad. I took my notes and I wrote Gambit's voice down as a negative. It just is. It, it's like it's not stereotypical enough, but it's also not... It's like they don't care. It's almost like he just literally phones it in. Like, any parody Gambit voice you could do right now would be better than the Gambit voice on the cartoon. White, black, whatever you look like, it doesn't matter. You probably sound more like Gambit than this dude. And other than that, you know, that's really my biggest dig at this show so far is still the voice acting not being on point. Now, the guy that does Wolverine is a little older, you can tell, but that's okay. I mean... I would rather still have him there, because when he gets into the Berserker Rage and all that shit, like, it really does feel like Wolverine and the X-Men, and all of these things are back. And that's such a rarity to say in today's day and age. So many things like Ghostbusters seem tiresome, they seem out of place, they seem old hat. X-Men 97 doesn't feel like old hat. If you liked last week's episodes, you're going to like this week's episodes. Again, it's a different type of mutant story. It's more personal. It's about the X-Men themselves. It's not about X-Men versus humanity. There's no government this week. There's no Sentinels. Well, hold on. There's a fucking demonic Sentinel that comes from hell, and it's one of the coolest things ever. Again, I can't really... I don't want to spoil the coolest part of the episode. I'm intentionally being vague here because I will say this week, this is the one you should watch. If you haven't seen any of the other episodes, of course, you need context for certain things. But if you're like me or like other people that like the X-Men, you already know this era of the X-Men. You already know what's going to happen next. You're just here to see how it happens next. And it's really great from a comic book standpoint. That's really how it should go. Because when you're adapting a comic book, you're adapting something that's already iconic. So why would you not pull from the things that people already love? You're buying the brand. Use the part of the brand that people already like too. You don't have to just give us the characters and strip them of everything they like. We like the audience and give us something new. No, take them on these adventures. Give us these adventures adapted in a different way. You know, we're all still hungry for a good Dark Phoenix saga on film. We're still hungry for a great adaptation of the Sentinels. All of these things. Like, we're all ready for more of this stuff. It doesn't matter if it's some of the same stories. It's how to adapt it in the best way possible. Make the definitive version. And then figure out how to create the definitive version of all iconic X stories. Or all iconic Spider-Man stories. And then when you run out of that in decades, then you can go and try to create new crap or adapt the new shit that isn't really tested yet, that fans aren't on board for, that merchandise kinda sells for, but then is ultimately found on clearance. Like, that Spider-Woman from the new end of the Spider-Verse movie. She was everywhere. Nobody wanted her. I guess a pregnant Spider-Lady isn't a hot-selling action figure? Who'd have thunk it? That's why X-Men 97 really only delves into original classic characters. So you know what, folks? We're gonna call it a day. This was another fun episode of X-Men to watch. I'm not giving stuff number reviews, and I can't really give it a skip it stream at physical media since there's not a physical media to give it. So I'm just gonna give it a stream it because X-Men 97 is a good time. I've enjoyed all three episodes so far to the point where I've considered going back to watch them just because I'm like, hey, I could go back and watch some X-Men. Take all of that into account. Last week, I talked about the political stuff. You heard my views and my takes, so I'm not going to reiterate that every week because that's boring. Nobody really wants to hear uh, qualifiers to X, Y, and Z. I said what I had to say last week. So make sure you guys hear that first review to hear what my criteria is to review this and all the other fun idiosyncrasies that I bring to the interviews and reviews and all the fun stuff here on the channel.
But folks, I want to thank you guys for watching. I apologize. I'm a little under the weather today. I got back from a convention. Kind of got con crud, so I'm just feeling a little uh. But I wanted to make sure that you guys got this right away because, well, I'm reading the comments section and you guys are liking all the new stuff. And so this is the new WCBS. We are the epitome of pop culture after all. And we're here to entertain you most days. So folks, be on the lookout for Woke Busters. I can't stress enough how big it is. It's massive. It's coming your way really soon. I will have the Kickstarter up live in a couple of days. I uh, just want to make sure I have this trailer and a few things made to my liking because you got to do stuff the right way. You know, it's a very competitive field out there. And I know that Woke Busters is the best graphic novel to come out this year, next year, and the year after that, and so on moving forward. But I want to make sure that everybody can see that with the most exciting, enticing package possible. So Woke Busters is being worked on in the advertising standpoint, and then it's going to be uh, promoted live across every platform known to man. Kind. So folks, thank you for watching. I'll be back next time with more. And you know, one other thing, I'm feeling uh, the love that we're getting back. So I'm going to have a review of Godzilla tomorrow. I'm going to go out and see the film, have a spoiler free and a spoiler review. And we'll talk about it on the podcast as well. So if you guys want to catch me live at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, March 28th. Well, you know where I am, you know where I will be. Here at WCBS headquarters on YouTube, on X, on Twitter, on Rumble, you name it, WCBS is there. And be on the lookout, folks, for some big channel-changing news in the coming weeks as we get closer to episode 400 of World Class Bullshitters, the epitome of pop culture. So, folks, I've rambled on long enough. I guess I love doing this, so I'm going to make myself wait until next time. So I'll end it like this. Be smart, be safe, be cool, but always be excellent to each other. And if you're feeling generous, stick around for the next 55 seconds. It might change your life for the good. Stealing Solo asked the greatest what-if question of all time. What if a group of disgruntled Star Wars fans kidnap Harrison Ford and force him to remake Star Wars in their basement? That, and a whole lot more, is answered in Stealing Solo, a Captain's parody. Stealing Solo has been called Laugh Out Loud Funny and the greatest Star Wars parody since Spaceballs, and it's available now for a limited time only. Go to StealingSolo.com, which is powered by Shopify, so you get the reward-winning safety and security, and get yourselves a copy today. Once we sell through this limited backstock, I'm going back to the drawing board to bring you the sequel, which parodies Luke Skywalker's Fall from Grace, and finally the closing chapter, which I can't wait to get to, Frankenfisher, the Bride of Solo. And yes, it's exactly what you think it is. So folks, the only way to get that is go to StealingSolo.com right now, get yourselves a copy, and enjoy the greatest Star Wars parodies in Spaceballs.